Okay, so today, sorry for that interruption. I appreciate you all filling out those surveys. Um, it's critical for funding and that sort of thing. I'm glad they came in to make sure everybody filled them out correctly and what have you. Um, so today we're going to go back into V-Ray. And like I said, we're going to flip-flop back and forth a little bit. I'm seeing a lot of tables and chairs starting to materialize, which is good. Uh, I'm liking what I'm seeing, which is also good. Um, but we need to start, part of, part of the strategy here is there's a certain amount of, you know, we have to physically make stuff in Rhino, but then we also have to learn how the textures uh, really apply to it. And thus far, you've, you've managed to stick some, some materials on some objects, but haven't really played around with how they apply, what they look like, and that sort of thing. And so today's purpose uh, is really to learn about how to texture map objects. Um, we'll also cover a little bit about how you can work with blocks and create and reuse objects, and we'll use that more and more as we go along. Um, so what I've asked you to do in part one is to create a variety of shapes, which I've already done here. There's no right or wrong answer. There's no right or wrong size for these shapes. We just need some shapes so that you can see how these materials start to apply to the objects. Uh, I also have created a wall that goes along the back here. Uh, that wall also happens to have a doorway in it. They're three separate objects, and I'm going to walk you through kind of how to texture something across all three objects at once. Uh, so we will. Uh, I'm going to use this primarily as an example uh, so that we can work through each of the, the um, texture mapping techniques. Uh, I'm asking in the first part one for you to do the same just so you can play around and see how this stuff works um, though it won't necessarily be the most attractive thing in the world but it, it, it will teach you uh, how this stuff comes together and then we'll move on to the other parts uh, a little bit later so um, what I'd like for you to load and for those of you that don't have the, uh, the resource library available yet um, we'll take a quick break and I'll wander around and make sure you all get that Q drive set up um, uh, hopefully you've learned at least by now how to load it yourself. Um, eventually these computers are going to be imaged and <laughs> we won't have to do that anymore. But for now, uh, we have to do that. So a uh, quick way to check is I'm going to open my material editor in V-Ray. Uh, let me remove these materials for just a second. And I'm going to right click on scene materials. And I'm going to go to load material. And then I'm going to look for uh, Q, the Q drive, uh, resources, and then V-Ray materials. And if it's not there, I'm going to come and help you guys in just a second. Uh, what I want is I'm going to pick siding, and then I'm going to pick one that's kind of a plank siding. Uh, I'm going to use this rough wood staggered. Uh, the reason that I'm picking something like this is it's a very obvious uh, texture to it. And so we can really see what direction the, the material is applying. If you pick something like metal or glass, not going to have much direction to it, therefore you're not going to learn as much about texture mapping. So uh, we'll take a, a quick break and make sure that everybody has a few drive uh, or is in process. So the ET116 license server, you go all the way down to the license server.
Down the road, we're going to want to make sure that um, we can uh, load it off the Q drive because when we do the network render, it'll be more resources. There'll be a lot more resources for it, and you'll use more than one computer, and it needs to know where a central location, oh. where all the materials are. That's why it matters right now. Uh -huh. um, so, are you restarting too? Um, yeah. So you guys just bear with me. If you're if you're hanging out, work on your chairs for a little bit. We want to make sure these two uh, computers get it, and then we'll we'll move. It's probably me. <laughs> probably something I did. That's usually what it is. bring it in last time, did I? Yeah. I think I shattered my lens and that's why I didn't. <laughs> Managed to kick this over and break the lens with the camera. Right. It actually turned out to be really cheap. It was about a two dollar part. It cracked the mounting ring, what it did. And then I just ordered the replacement mounting ring and took the part put it back together. It seems to work. But yeah, I was afraid it was going to have to go back to Nikon. Mm. I did that with my camera once. I left the camera out in the sun and it fried some chip inside it. I had to send it back to Nikon and repair it. Why is it asking me for a Keep hitting the space. High security, you know? Try a different computer. Either that, or I could see Chuck's not here, so of course the server will crash, right?
On your iDisk, disk, you already have the material. Mm -hmm. Just load it in there. Okay. And I don't, you know, for today it's not going to matter. All right. Rendering time, I don't know what's wrong with the server. <coughs> okay. So sorry for that interlude. Um, if you if you load shingles or planks or bricks or something that has a certain texture that repeats, that you can tell which direction it is, that's useful. Uh, I'm using this planks rough wood, and unlike uh, normal, <coughs> I'm actually going to assign it to each object individually. And as we go, we'll we'll see the options here. Uh, so I'm going to right click on the material and say apply a material to selection. I'm just going to apply it to this object. Um, and so typically, when I'm modeling, I'm modeling in this shaded mode here because I can see all of my <coughs> curves and that sort of thing. Uh, when, however, we're dealing with texture mapping, it's useful to switch into what's called rendered mode. Uh, the dangerous part about rendered mode is that while it looks good, um, <laughs> you lose out on any lines or curves or, or whatever um, that, that exist, and so you can't see them. If you're accidentally in this mode and you keep drawing lines and you can't understand why they don't show up, that's what happens. Uh, you can get really stuck with something like that. So the lines have gone away and I have just the object itself. Uh, and so I'm going to zoom selected on just this object so we can look at this um, at kind of how it's coming together. So it looks like the texture mapping is okay around the sides of it, but the top, the boards are a lot, uh, they're skewed and they're a lot bigger than we wanted them to be, where the sides, they look ap uh, appropriate. And so this is where something called texture mapping comes into play. And so if we have the properties window or the properties pane showing, uh, which is what is normally showing, uh, we can get to it right from there. If for some reason this isn't here, it's listed under panels, and then um, you can go, you can click on any one of these layers, object properties, and it'll bring up this, this pane uh, there. So what we want is we want the object properties, which are here. Uh, the, the first button here <coughs> is just properties of the object. It tells us what layer it's on, what color it is, that sort of thing. The next um, click here, uh, next button is for material. Uh, we can tell that right now it's assigned by object and it has planks assigned to it. And the last one is what's called texture mapping. And that's really what we're going to play around with today. Uh, and this is how we apply a texture to an object. And there's different strategies for how this happens. And so I'm going to, if I can find a pen, I'm going to draw here for just a second to help illustrate this. So if we have something like a box, And we want to apply a texture to this uh, um, to this particular object. If we have picked a box mapping, basically what it will do is it will create a box for us, something like this. And it will then apply the texture that's on this down onto this top surface. And it will apply the texture that's on the front here straight through onto the front of the surface there. And the same thing with this texture will be applied to that surface there. Does that kind of make sense? Mm -hmm. um, and so box mapping is really good for rectangles, walls, those kinds of objects. But it's not very good for cylinders, for example. And so we'll talk about what you would use instead. So for box mapping, we're going to pick this apply box mapping uh, button, which is the one, two, three, four, fifth over. And one of the important things to note is that when we pick on that apply box mapping, there's a prompt at the command line. And a lot of times you'll pick the box mapping and forget about the command prompt and move on and do something else and say, why didn't it apply? Uh, so we do want to make sure that we read the command prompt. It says first corner of base, or you can pick bounding box. Um, generally, bounding box is useful because it just contains the entire object. 
Uh, and so it's almost always that you're going to pick bounding box, but you can choose to draw your own box if you wanted to, for example. So I'm going to go ahead and click bounding box. It'll then ask whether you want the coordinate system to be world coordinates or seaplane coordinates. 99.9% .9 of the time you're going to pick world coordinates, uh, which is the default. Then it will also ask, do you want this to be a capped box or not? Do you want it to have a lid on it? And so in this case, yes, we do want it to be capped. And I'll go ahead and, and click on it, and it's now completed the box method. So if we look at my object, number one, the texture got a little bit smaller. But number two, uh, it applies uniformly to each side of my, um, my box here. Uh, and if we were to look at this side, for example, the boards run up this side. And as I rotate, they fold over and continue right up the top here. And then they fold down this particular side and then across the bottom. Right? Likewise, they chain around the edge. They wrap around the corner. This board here continues to there, and it continues around to right there, etc. Okay. Now, because this is box mapped, we can't wrap in both directions and have it seamless. So when we get to this edge, you can see that there's a board running horizontally, and there's the end of all of these boards. Okay. And that's normal. Uh, that's to be expected on this kind of a mapping. Okay. There are options associated with this mapping. And so if I have the object selected like this, uh, and we look under the mapping button here, we can see down we have that this is a box, right? The projection is from the closest point. We could change to array if we wanted to. Generally, you're not going to. Uh, the texture space is usually single um, for, for the simple objects. Uh, we have an x, y, z position and an x, y, z rotation. Generally, you're not going to change either of those values. When we get down here to x, y, z size, this is the size of the object in inches because my default units are in inches. So right now the object is 48 by 48 by 48. Um, because this is a square, there's not a whole lot that's going to change. Um, if we had something like the wall behind, which we'll get to, you'll see a difference in these values, and I'll, I'll explain what those are at that point. Okay. Down below that, we have UVW offset, UVW repeat, and UVW rotation. Um, the UVW repeat is critical if you want to make your overall texture smaller, <coughs> right? So if I click the little lock icon, I can adjust them independently, but you're going to typically want to do them all at once. Uh, and let's say I go from being 1 to being 2. When that happens, the, the density of the texture doubles, okay? If I went to 4, right, we get really small, okay? Likewise, I could do 0.5, and it will get much bigger. Okay? So depending on what it is that we're trying to, to texture map and how dense we want this material to appear, we can adjust that UVW repeat. Um, likewise, we can change the UVW rotation uh, in one of these values. So for example, if I picked the last value here and I type 90, right, it would change the, the orientation of this box. So now it, we're going up and down right, instead of horizontal. Uh, to me, it's always a little bit challenging uh, to figure out what second, let me get back here. To figure out what these UVW rotations do, and so it's either a trial and error where you type in. Uh, I typed in 90 down here. If I typed in 90 here, what happens? Okay, it looks ugly, so we don't want to do that one. So uh, it's kind of a, a trial and error thing. The truth, though, is that the easier way and the more accurate way of adjusting this, if I wanted to adjust it is to use something called this the show the mapping. Okay? And so up here at the top we have options as we come all the way here to the side we have something called show mapping. Mm -hmm. When we click on that we get a highlighted ye little yellow box that will show us basically what our mapping is doing and where our mapping is coming from. Okay? It doesn't look like a whole lot right now, but I can transform this yellow box just like any other object. And Thus far in Rhino, we've been using our basic transformations, moves, rotates, scales, that sort of thing. I can do the same thing with this object. Um, Rhino has another tool that's built into it that's called the gumball. And I stay away from teaching it except in this context uh, because I don't think it's as accurate as it should be and you should be modeling. Uh, but I'm going to actually turn it on to, to illustrate some stuff. Uh, it's down here at the bottom, just like our re regular ortho, osnap, etc. It's called gumball. And it turns on this icon uh, that's in the middle of the screen that has a red, a green, and a blue axis. It also has a red and a green blue arc. 
and it also has little squares that are coming out uh, as red, green, and blue. Okay? Those are all ways of manipulating this particular object. Um, the ones that I'm going to be concerned with right now are the arcs. And so, for example, if I wanted to rotate this object, right, if I click on the green arc and I drag, right, I can jump to 90 degrees, and you can see that as I did that, I changed the orientation of this texture mapping. Right? Likewise, I can grab the red arc and jump, and I can switch the orientation that direction. Right? So I can. this is where Gumball works really well because I can really um, scale and manipulate this object where accuracy doesn't really matter too much uh, with relative ease. The little squares on the end adjust the scale so you can see that I can scale my object. When I just did that, I got dense on the sides. I didn't affect the end. Right? The green would affect the end like that. Right? Uh, Likewise, I could adjust the height with the red, like that. And you can kind of see live what's happening. Does that make sense? I'm going to undo and go back to my normal square. Okay. Uh, I can also move the texture mapping. I can move this box down. Um, it doesn't really do us any good to, to adjust that right now, but I'm at least pointing it out. So in this instance, dealing with your texture mapping, when it's shown, I think this gumball tool is very useful. Um, but personally, I stay away from it when I'm modeling because of its lack of a, uh, you know, consistent accuracy. Um, it's a relatively new tool. Uh, so I'll go ahead and click on it, turn it off, uh, and then when I'm done, we'll once again click on my object, uh, and I'm going to go to hide texture mapping, and then that'll go away. Okay. So I've dealt with this cube as an object. Now I'm going to move on to the cylinder, and we're going to walk through the cylinder. Okay. So I'm going to go to uh, my material editor, right click on my material and say apply material to selection. And now we're seeing this as a cylinder. Uh, and if I zoom in a little bit, let me zoom selected so we're working around this particular object. We can see that it didn't do a particularly bad job of applying it um, by default, but we want to get a little bit finer control. So once again with the object selected, I'll come over to my texture mapping, and this time I'm going to pick the, uh, what is it, the seventh option? One, two, three, it's the cylinder mapping. Okay? Uh, and so when I say apply cylinder mapping, same thing up here. It says base of cylinder or bounding box. And usually I just stick to the bounding box because it's the easiest way of doing it. Um, we also have the ability to turn it to solid. And so I'll say yes, it is a solid. Uh, and then we'll pick bounding box. Coordinate system is world. Um, and do I want it cap? Yes, I do. Okay, so it then builds up my object here, uh, and we can see that it's roughly the same. But the way the cylindrical mapping works is instead of mapping it square, which would distort the edges if I did a box mapping. In this instance, it's expecting it to be curved, so the mapping curves, so we get a little bit better texture uh, as we go around this particular object. Okay, likewise, it does have a cap on it. Okay, and I can manipulate this object the same way. So if we look here under the, the mapping properties, okay, this cylinder is taller than uh, the the base. So 48 by 48, and my x and my y here are 4 feet by 4 feet. Then 96 because it's 8 feet tall, right? If I if I manipulate these values. Right. Let's say I switch that to 48.0. Right. Uh, we start to skew out and get undesirable results. So I'm going to leave it at 96 uh, in this instance uh, like that. These buttons also do things. I'm going to show you those a little bit later on uh, in terms of what they do. Now, when we get to UVW repeat, right? how many times it repeats in one direction, if I lock it and I increase it, so we'll go 2, for example, the density increases. Okay. If I unlock it and change, say, the x and the y to be 1, right, it should adjust the mapping. Um, we want this one to be 2. There we go. Uh, so I can adjust how many of these little boards appear on the front. Right. Um, the other thing that is useful, just like uh, we've done before, is I can turn on, sorry, I keep right-clicking here, I can turn on 
my mapping cylinder, there it is, and I can work with the gumball the same way as before. Okay, so I turn that on, turn the gumball on, uh, and it will allow me to do some stuff, like if I want the um, cylinder to get a little bit smaller, I can make that adjustment as well. Okay, in this instance here, right, you can see that it wraps down the side of the cylinder, right, you get skewed on the end. Uh, and so we can continue making these kinds of adjustments uh, to what you want to have happen. Uh, I could make a rotation, for example. Oops. I lost the selection of the map. Right? And I could change how the cylinder was applied to the object. Um, likewise, I could rotate it this way, changing basically the look of it, depending on what, what it is that you're trying to create uh, with it. I can also scale certain pieces of the object. Right, I can scale pieces of the object, etc. Uh, and so you can play around with this. I'm just trying to show you how that works. Okay. When we move on to, let me hide this mapping. Hide mapping, perfect. When we move on to the sphere, uh, no surprise, I'm going to pick the spherical mapping uh, strategy. So let me go ahead and assign the material first. Right click and say apply material to selection. And so if we look at it, it actually doesn't do too bad of a job when I first create it. There it is. It gets a little bit distorted at the top and the bottom. Okay. Uh, I'm going to apply that spherical mapping. There. It's this one. And in this instance, I'm going to use just a bounding box. And it's going to be world coordinates. Uh, and now this one's the easiest one to manipulate. Uh, using that gumball. So let me go select it, turn on the mapping, uh, and then I can very easily you know, rotate which direction uh, the mapping has been applied. Does that kind of make sense? Maybe, maybe not. Uh, the biggest thing is to play around with it and you'll start to see how this works. Okay. So in this particular context, is it relatively unrealistic to have this wood texture on the ball because the boards aren't going to actually bend that way? Yes. So you'd be picking a different texture, but it still has to do with how it's applied. So if I was applying like a brushed material or something like that, there, there are ways of making it look more accurate. Okay. When we get down here <coughs> to the last two, it's actually going to get a little bit more complicated. So I'm going to come back to these as a, as a whole, and we're going to go back to the wall first. Uh, because I want to kind of talk through that. So if I select this wall, turn off the wall so it goes away, uh, and I apply my material to it, okay, that's great. We've applied it. Uh, we go to the next one, and I say apply material, selection, and we go to the last one, and I say apply material selection. Okay, and if we look at this, up close, you can see that the two don't match, right? It doesn't look like a seamless application of material, uh, which is kind of problematic because I want this to be like a door where this is a continuous material that, that flows across the, the objects. So when I do that, I'm going to select all three of the objects, hold down shift. I could join them together into one poly surface. I don't have to, uh, and it's important to recognize that. And since this wall is roughly a box, I'm going to go ahead and use the box mapping. And so when I pick that box mapping, I'm going to say, yes, I want it to be a bounding box. Yes, I want it to be world. Uh, and yes, I want it to be cat. And you notice that it recreates right, this wall such that the texture applies seamlessly from this object to this object. Does that kind of make sense? Uh, so it's critical when you're creating something like this to actually play around with working that way. Okay. Now, if I make an adjustment to these, I still have to select all three and go back and make the adjustment. Because the adjustment, if I just select one, won't apply to all three. And so we have to make sure all three are selected when I make that adjustment. Now, this is where we've got some problems. Okay, So I did the wall, and the texture here right, is way too dense on the top for what it is on the face. And it's also way too dense in this direction. It's all squished together. So this is where I'm going to change how this is uh, applied a bit. Okay, so let me go back and select all three of these, like that. And right here in this XYZ size, we have several different values. Okay, I'm going to go back to this 111 value, 
and it's going to get really, really dense, but it's going to be consistent on all sides. Okay? When I get to that value, it's too dense. So let me come back, and I'm just going to say instead of that 1, 1, 1, we'll go back, and I will go x equals y equals z, okay? which evens it out at a higher value. Okay? I could manually go back and type this in, but when that happens, right, you can see that the texture on top matches the texture on the side, matches the texture that goes through the door. Okay? But this is still way too big of, of boards. So I'm going to go back to my UVW repeat, and we'll change this to maybe 4, something like that. Yeah, it's looking pretty good. Uh, and so now we're getting repeat, but if we look in here, the board looks like it's in the correct texture as it wraps around that particular opening. Okay. Likewise, at the top and the bottom, uh, it's approximately in the correct um, size, uh, but it's even side to side to side. Okay. So that's how you work with something that's a wall. You remember, you have to select all three objects in order to have the texture apply across the various uh, shapes. Okay, so let's get into the more complicated objects here. The cones and the spheres and this sort of thing. And this is where, when you have too complicated of an object, you're going to want to start playing around with some more custom mapping uh, on this particular object. Uh, and so we'll start first with uh, this pyramid. And if I go ahead and go to my materials and I apply the rough wood, and we look at it, okay? Right now, it's by default applying, let me zoom selected. By default, it's applying and coming together at a point, which might be what we're after in, in this particular context, but it might not be. If it's not what we're after, we can use one of these other presets to approximate what we're trying to, to map, how we're trying to map it. So I'll try cylindrical mapping, for example. Uh, we'll use a bounding box. And we'll do word coordinates. Okay? And you'll see that it now goes in the opposite direction, making these concentric rings. Okay? If I didn't want the concentric rings to be stacked up like this, I can show in my properties, I can show my mapping. Show my mapping. And I can then rotate my mapping using the gumball, uh, which may or may not look the way I wanted it to. Uh, it's supposed to look here. I think I have, I think I accidentally put two maps on top of each other. But obviously it's not doing what I wanted to do. No, it doesn't look like I did. Uh, so, cones are harder. Um, I, can, I can also work with these values. So, for example, I could change this value to 90 uh, and get somewhat different results, but it's really not doing exactly what I want it to do. Let's go back to zero. Um, and so, in this context, and I'm going to show it over here because it's a little bit easier, we're going to use a different mapping technique because this cylindrical or spherical or, or box mapping isn't quite right for these objects because they're a little bit more custom. And so, we're going to use this unwrap. Uh, to create it. And so I'll work with unwrap here. There are more steps involved in unwrap, and I have yet to do a good video walkthrough of how this works, um, so it's on my to-do list. Uh, but I'm going to do my best to try to explain it to you uh, right now. So, on an object like this, uh, actually, you know what, let's just hide everything else so we don't get confused. And I'm going to work just with this object here. Oops. Okay. So I'm going to select it, go to my materials, and apply it, apply material to selection. And then let's have a look at this object, Seems selected. Uh, and so each one of these faces is kind of applied somewhat consistently until we get to this face and it's off. The bottom lines up not with anything. Uh, so this is really not what we were after. Okay? And I want finer control. So what we're going to do is we're going to use the unwrap uh, texture mapping technique. And so what this is going to do, how many people have taken 130 here? Maybe a few of you. Do you guys remember when you did the exercise where you unwrapped the shape, cut it out, and you glued it together? Right? This is basically what we're doing, but we're doing it digitally. Okay? And so when I click the unwrap, it's going to say select seams. And so this is where am I going to cut on the object that's going to let me fold this object out. So we'll cut, for example, right here, and then we'll cut around the base. 
and I'll cut. My mouse, I apologize, is really touchy today. Back up, unwrap. We'll cut here, there, there. Okay, sorry. I can't right click and orbit without the mouse thinking it's a different thing. I'm, I'm just right now going down and then around, not all the way to the bottom, because I want this shape to be somewhat connected together. So if I were folding this out, it would split here, cut around there, and the bottom would be attached to this face on the opposite mm -hmm. side. Okay. Now when I hit enter, okay, I've selected the seams and it says, okay, great, you did that. And so if we looked at it, it kind of looks like it wraps around, stop. I'm telling you that my mouse is really lame. It's like the button's stuck. Okay. Okay, so it wraps around some of the faces the way we want it to. There, there, there. Right, wraps across there. So that's pretty good. Okay. But I'd like to have some finer control over how this really is, is working. So what I'm going to do is with the object selected, there. Um, I'm going to go to this last option, which is called the UV Editor. And this is one of the most challenging things to kind of conceptualize. And so what the UV Editor does is it gives me a rectangle that will represent, maybe, the unfolded surface. So if I hold down and create that rectangle, doesn't matter what size I draw it, uh, it will draw the unrolled shape right there on top of a rectangle that will be representative of the material. And so in this instance, if I were to select it, notice that when I select this, it selects my object too, so they're chained together. Uh, if I were to select this and we look over here at UV Editor, uh, right now it says Use Material, but since it's a V-Ray material, it's not loading the material, it's just showing gray. So I'm going to use Texture, which is this button, uh, which gives me a numbered checkerboard such that I can follow how the numbered checkerboard works. Okay. That's still too hard for me. I'd like to see a preview of my actual material. So what I'll do is I'll click on the little triangle here, and I'm going to add with the little plus sign, and I'm going to go find that board texture. Uh, and so I'm going to click on bitmap te texture here, and I'm going to go to the Q drive, and I'm going to go to resources, and I'm going to go to my materials, and I'm going to go to siding, and I'm going to go into wood, and I'm going to get to my planks, rough wood, staggered, and there it is. Okay. The way the materials are made, there's always a picture that comes from that material, or almost always. I can use that to my advantage. So I'll go ahead and say open, uh, and then I'll say OK when that's done. And it will the re then replace right, what's on the ground here with something that I can actually see and manipulate. And so this is where it starts to get interesting. So if I look at my object, right, how the, the seams apply here are how they apply on the object themselves. So I can transform this object, and it'll it'll adjust what the scene looks like over here. So let's say, for example, I wanted to scale this object. So I can type scale, and I wanted to make this a little bit smaller, right? As I make that smaller, right, it adjusts over here. Likewise, if I wanted to move it such that the point was, let me turn off ortho for a second. I don't know, right on top of a knot. Oops. There. Trying to find something notable that we can all see easily. I don't know, we'll put it right on top of that knot for right now. Uh, and then I were to go back and look at my shape. Right, that knot is right there at the point. Okay. Likewise, right, if I didn't like this rotation, I could rotate this object. You know, let's say I wanted the seams to go, you know, vertically up this section and horizontally up that section. Anything, basically, anything that I do over here is going to apply to the object over here, right? Um, I can also choose when I created this object instead of just doing the seams where this is all a connected object, I could choose to break them into individual objects and rotate them in completely independently on each face. 
Um, so it's up to you as to how you want these to, to, to work. I might be able to explode them in this view. And I haven't tried it. No, it won't let me. So I have to do the scene separately. Okay, when I'm done, I go ahead and click apply and it goes away. And now I'm back to where I have just my object uh, that has hopefully has the texture map applied the way I wanted it to. Right? And so one of these sides, there it is, where it wraps underneath on the bottom. Okay? So this is for when things get a little bit more complicated. It's harder to do, but whenever you have that kind of complex object, it's useful to play around with that um, to try to get really good results. Okay? So what you're going to be doing today is to play around with the texture mapping on these sample objects. Right? Then we're going to go and, and start to try to apply it to something that you've done. Uh, and so what we're going to do is in part three, we're going to open the object that we created in exercise 206. So I'll go ahead and click save for this, and then I'm going to go to file open, which is the bridge. So let me go back to my 136. I'll open the concrete bridge, and I'll go ahead and say open. Okay, here's that concrete bridge. Looks like I have two of them. Uh, when I, when I start to work with this, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a block that represents this piece of the bridge. Then I'll create a new file and bring in a bunch of these uh, and chain them together to make the bridge itself. So I'm building one piece, uh, but I want things like the material set up. I want the layers set up. I want to make sure there's not anything extra in the scene. So I'm going to go ahead and spend a little bit of time cleaning things up before I apply the material. It doesn't really matter whether I apply the material. Maybe I'll apply the material first. It doesn't really matter. So, I wanted to apply a concrete material to this particular piece. I go to material, looks like I already have a uh, trowel finish, or in this case, this is the vertical seam. Okay, let's use the vertical seam. So, I'm going to select, oops, let me turn off. My infinite plane underneath, there it is. Um, go to materials, and let me apply this vertical plywood. Apply material to selection. And then let me look at, notice I selected everything. Right? Let me look in rendered mode at how this is, is actually applying uh, to this particular object. And so I've got a seam that's running right there. I actually kind of like having the seam right there. Right? Seems, seems to be applied fairly well. Might be a little bit dense. So let's, let's play around with some of our options. So once again, I'll go to properties and I'll apply box mapping to it. And we'll use a bounding box. We want it to be world. We want it to be capped. And now we'll have a look. Okay, there's a seam in the middle. It wraps around very nicely. Right, that seam runs all the way down the side across that little piece. Yeah, this is looking pretty good. I'm pretty happy with it. Okay, notice this shape is roughly a box, so it's no surprise that the box mapping applies fairly well to it. Okay, so I've gone ahead and I've done that. This is the one that I'm going to use. Uh, now it's the time to kind of clean things up a little bit. So let me go back to shaded mode for a second. I'm going to delete this object altogether. Oops. I'm going to delete that object altogether. I'm going to take this object and I'm going to think about where I would like to be able to copy and paste it from. Right? Uh, so I'm going to set this point right there. Uh, so let's go to move. And we'll move this to 0, 0. Okay, so now I have that piece of the concrete uh, bridge. Perfect. Let me go to layers. We're going to rename this layer to be bridge. If I can type. There we go. Um, the rest of these layers are extra, including my infinite plane. I don't want that to be included anymore. So I'm going to select all of those layers, and I'm going to get rid of them. Uh, so I'll press the delete key. It says, are you sure you want to delete this because it has an object on it? Yes, I do. Uh, and I end up with just the bridge layer. If you have something that's more complex than just this um, this setup, uh, where you have, for example, when we do the glass and the spider, you'll have the nested layers, right? In this case, I only have the bridge. Uh, and I'm going to go ahead and save this, and I'll go to File, Save, or let's do Save As, and we'll call this Concrete Bridge. That's fine. Uh, call this Concrete Bridge uh, Final. And I'll click Save. Okay, so now I have the bridge. But I'd like to be able to chain together a ramp, too. Uh, and so I'm going to do something, now that the texture is all applied, I'm going to do something called a cage edit, uh, which is useful. It's under Rhino 5.12. Uh, 
that will walk through how the cage edit works. Um, if I go up to my transform and I go to cage editing, cage edit, uh, you can create a cage as a separate operation. The tutorial walks through creating the cage first, then doing the cage edit. I think you can probably skip to just doing the cage edit. And it's going to say select captive objects, which basically is all of my objects. I'll hit enter. Select control object. We're going to do just a bounding box. Coordinate system is going to be world. Now, cage points are going to be how I'm going to divide this up. And so if I left it at 4 by 4 by 4, I'm going to end up with a bunch of points that I can manipulate. I'm going to do that just so you can see the way it works here. Uh, and so good. We've got region to edit global. Enter. OK. So you can see that it divided up my object into a whole series of these little points. You see how that worked? Okay. Now, I can click and drag on any one of these uh, points, hopefully, there, uh, and it will manipulate my overall object to do whatever it is that I want it to do, something like that. So it's a really easy way of transforming a, a static object. Now, this has way too many objects for me to try to control. So I'm going to back up here to my cage edit, and we're going to do a new cage edit. I swear this right click is killing me. Uh, and so we're going to go up to um, transform, cage editing, cage edit, bounding box, world. OK, now the x, the y, and the z, I'm going to change that to be 2, 2, and 2, which is the minimum that it'll let you do. Okay. Notice the degree also changes to 1, 1, and 1. We'll come back and review cage editing down the road, too. Um, this is now 1, 1, and 1. When I hit Enter, region to edit global is fine. You see that instead of all of those points, I end up with just a couple points. Much easier. Okay. So I'm going to take the back half as a selection. There's four points. And I'm going to do a move command. And I want it to be vertical. And I'm going to move it up by three inches. Okay, very subtle. Right, and you can kind of see that it's moved. Now that that's done, I can hit escape and I'm going to go to File, Save As. And instead of being a bridge, this is going to be a ramp. And I'll go ahead and click Save. And so now I have a bridge and a ramp. If I went to my materials once again, rendered mode, we confirm that my materials still apply correctly. Okay. Maybe in this instance, because it's going up, I'd like to change it because I have a seam that's that's right there. Um, we can select my object, go back into my texture mapping here, uh, and we could do a UVW offset. So we could we could basically move the texture down. Um, I don't know. Let's try 0.5. See if it does what we want it to do. It didn't. Not convenient. None of them would do it, right? There it is. Okay, so I just moved that down a little bit so that my seam would be a little bit lower on the object. Okay, so that's done. I'll go ahead and save it one more time. And now what I want is a brand new Rhino file with nothing in it. So we'll open up a fresh Rhino file. Okay, and so this is where things get powerful in Rhino. So I'm going to go to File, or excuse me, Edit, Blocks, Insert Block Instance. And this is kind of like an XREF in AutoCAD if you've worked in AutoCAD before. Uh, and I'm going to load in, so I'll click on this, and I'm going to go to my flash drive. There's 136, there's Exercise 206. I'm going to do my bridge first, which is here. I'll go ahead and click Open. Say OK. Uh, and so I want to embed and link. That's one thing that's important, is I'm going to embed and link. The embed is in case you lost your original file, it would still be there. The link is important because if you update the original, it will update the stuff in your drawing, right? which I'll go back and show you. Right? So we brought it in, and we'll go ahead and place this. I want it to be somewhere up in the sky, so let me go ahead and 
Um, make sure it's it's floating up here somewhere. And clearly, I put it in the wrong direction here. Stop. Right click. Uh, let me rotate it 3D really fast. Actually, you know what? Let's put it in again. Uh, let me go to Edit, Insert Block Instance, Block, Insert Block Instance. It was because I inserted it in the side view. Uh, and then let's just move this vertically, I don't know, 20 feet. Selected, there it is. Okay. Now, this, whenever I try to click it, it's going to be one solid object because it's a block. Okay, so I can't edit this without exploding it, and you don't want to explode it um, because that would defeat the purpose of having it as a block. But I can manipulate it by copying it, right, and pasting it, or even better, arraying it, right. And so we'll copy and paste for right now. So if we switch to being in rendered mode, for example, uh, we can see that I've, I've worked to build up that particular uh, section of bridge. Now I want the ramp to go up to one side and the ramp to go up to the other side. So let me go in and say, uh, excuse me, edit blocks, insert block instance. And this time I'm going to load the ramp. Say open, OK, OK. And so this happens frequently because we're using the same material for both what's existing in the scene and the one that I'm bringing in. It's saying, are you sure you want to override or do you want to create a new material? Um, in this instance, I know it's exactly the same material. I loaded that material twice, so that's fine. We're just going to use the existing scene material. We'll say, OK. Uh, and let me just drop this in. And uh, we'll drop it there for right now. And let me move. Copy it. Maybe a couple more times. Something like that. And so now we have the, the one side of that. Of course, I can mirror. Once again, my mouse keeps right clicking. <coughs> to that side, and I end up with the bridge. Okay. I might not have done my mirror correctly, but I think I did. Okay. So, in this instance, right, we see that unfortunately the cage came with these objects. Okay. When I go ahead and do the rendering, it's not going to matter, but given that it came with it, let me go back in and show you how it, it corrects itself. So I'm going to go to start. Now, because I have this open already, I want to make sure I open this from my flash drive. I've got a 136, 206, and it was the concrete ramp. Let's open that up. Turns out I already had it open. Sorry about that. So I don't want that cage anymore. Let's get rid of it. I'll press delete. As soon as I say file save, this will then be the updated version. If I switch back to the version here and I go to edit blocks, block manager, we'll see right here linked file is newer. I can click the update button, use the existing material and all of those cage, cages go away. Okay. Same thing happens, you say, you know, I really wasn't happy with how that material turned out. Uh, I think this bridge needs to be a different material. Right? We go back to the original file, go to here, right? select our object, 
go to my materials. Uh, I don't know. Let's load a different material altogether. Let's say um, concrete. I want it to be kind of a whitewashed concrete. Say OK. Apply material to selection. Excellent. As soon as I say file save, and I jump over here, when I go to edit blocks, insert block inst or block manager, once again link file is newer. When I click update, the new material is now applied to those objects. Does that kind of make sense for how it works? So if you think about this on a grander scale, when you start doing complex renderings, complex designs, that sort of thing. You might build the house in one environment, but you build all the furniture and bring all those pieces in as blocks. Maybe you build the windows and bring the windows in as blocks, such that you can very easily go back and make some corrections. Oh, I don't like the color of that glass. Let me go back to the original file and fix it. Right? It's a very good way of keeping good organized uh, files in Rhino. Uh, the other thing that's important to point out is uh, there is a layer in here called bridge that contains all of it. I really should go back to my ramp here. Let me go to the layers there, and I'm going to rename this to be ramp. Oops, sorry. When I go to file save, and I jump back to here, once again under edit blocks, block manager, link file is newer, we'll update it. Use the existing material, say OK. And you now see that there's a bridge and a ramp as two separate pieces. Right? So the layers come with it. The things that don't come in blocks are lighting and environments, right? which doesn't matter because you're not doing any lighting and environments yet. But long term, you need to remember that if you put lights in or anything in a block, like let's say you're building a lamp and you want to use that as a block, if you put a light in in the original file, bring it in as a block, the light won't come through. It's just the way blocks work. Okay? So. We've got that created. We'll throw an infinite plane underneath it, right, something like that. Um, if you get this far, you can go ahead and insert in your um, your glass behind it, right, create a glass wall behind it, uh, and you can let it render out uh, and see the, the end results. Obviously, I, I changed the material on these not to match that. Uh, but if we were to zoom in down something like this, should have a fairly accurate rendering of what this material is. It looks like the bump might be a little bit high, uh, which you can polish off uh, down the road. Okay? So, if you have extra time, work on exercise 201 or assignment 201, um, your tears and stuff. You'll see that that will fall at the bottoms of almost all the exercises over the next couple of class days. Um, and we'll go from there. <coughs>